of our revamped rounds. For those of you who have been coming for a while, might remember we used to do a weekly 45-minute seminar type thing. Now we've moved to monthly rounds. They tend to be more big picture. We try and feature multiple speakers and really make it kind of a fun, exciting event. We're online. You can tweet questions at us um, via the SPPH rounds hashtag, and it's going to be another amazing season of amazing stuff. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional territories of the Musqueam people and the type of learning, the type of storytelling that we are about to experience has been happening here for thousands of years. The type of learning and storytelling that we are about to experience has to do with poop. Uh, poop is, I mean, you see, you just say poop and people laugh, uh, which is a great way to kick off rounds for the year. Poop is a subject that I think is near and dear to public health people's hearts, but I think our reaction to poop is sort of bimodally uh, distributed. There's a lot of people, you know, folks working at the CDC, for example, for whom poop is generally bad news. If we are getting your poop at BC CDC, it means something is wrong with you and there's probably something nefarious hiding within that fecal sample. But as you're going to see today, um, poop has a very different meaning for a lot of people. Poop can be this magical, life-giving substance that can restore colonic health, uh, it can restore people's quality of lives, and so you've got this interesting paradigm. This summer, I also discovered another thing that poop can be, which is incredibly interesting and useful. Um, some of you might know that I do some work for CBC Television. Uh, they let me host the nature of things once or twice a season, and every episode that we do focuses on a different thing. And the thing that our episode that we shot this summer, which will air in January, focused on was poop and the interesting science behind brown stuff. So we covered a lot of fantastic stories. If I had to pick two that I think were most interesting, uh, just down the road um, in Cedro Woolley, you've probably driven past it on the I-5 when you've been going to Seattle and wondered, why is there a town called Cedro Woolley? Um, there's a really interesting thing in Cedro Woolley. It's a machine. Uh, the only processor that an engineer has built, and it is meant to take sewage, raw sewage, and through a distillation process, turn it into clean drinking water. They've already shipped one to the developing world. The second one, we saw it being built, and it's about to go out. So not only is poop potentially life-saving in the way that we're going to hear about today from Amy and Kieran, um, but it could potentially be turned into clean drinking water, which I think we all know, access to fresh drinking water is one of those social determinants of health factors that really dictates how healthy a particular community is. We've also got cute stories in the show, too. This is really just a cheap plug to get you to watch the nature things in January. Uh, we had this amazing dog, a little dog called Jack, and he's part of an organization called Conservation Canines. Conservation Canines trains rescue dogs that are being rescued from shelters to smell and detect the scat of different endangered animals or animals that are hard to find out in the wild that conservation programs are really interested in. So Jack, in particular, has been trained to recognize the smell of orca, killer whale poo. Because it turns out that if you're a fisheries biologist and you want to understand whether an orca population is physiologically stressed, if they're nutritionally stressed, if the females are pregnant, if anybody's sick, you can collect orca feces, which floats to the surface of the ocean. You can collect it, bring it back to the lab, do a bunch of different analyses on it, but it's really difficult to find this stuff out there in the ocean. So Jack has been trained to sit on the bow of a boat 
uh, boat drives around, and if he detects orca poo on the wind, he starts barking, his handler watches which way his nose is going, directs the boat driver to take him over to where they think that poop might be, reach into the water, scoop it up, bring it back to the lab, and scientists at the University of Washington and scientists at UBC who are doing the same thing on stellar sea lions are finding out really, really interesting things using poop as a barometer for the population health of animals instead of people. So it's an incredibly fascinating topic. We are just going to scratch its surface today, um, but we are super lucky to have SPPH's very own poop expert, Dr. Amy Maggies. <laughs> Those of you who are in the MPH program will recognize Amy as your admissions committee leader. Um, she's also based at BCCDC, where she runs a lab that studies not just poop, but pee things as well. Uh, <laughs> Amy's interested in things like foodborne urinary tract infections, and as you'll hear about today, uh, gut microbiome and fecal microbiome research. And then later on, I promised you multiple speakers, and we have joining us uh, from the University of Guelph via Skype, Kieran O'Doherty. He is in the Department of Psychology at the University of Guelph, and he's interested in the social, uh, social and ethical implications of healthcare related issues, science, technology, all of that good stuff. He did his postdoc at UBC, he was a visiting scholar in our very own W. Morris Young Center for Applied Ethics. So we've got a great uh, UBC and formerly UBC all poop doubleheader today. <laughs> uh, welcome to Poop Rounds. With that, um, I will advance through this slide that tells you, this will come up later too, if you need CME credit, uh, this is the survey link to do so. And Amy and Karen, take it away. Thank you, Jim. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to get right to it because we have a very short amount of time today. Uh, I don't have any conflicts to report. Uh, these are the learning objectives for today. So I'm going to talk about the microbiome. So it isn't the poop itself, but really the microbes that the poop contain that interest me the most, and its relationship to human health. We're going to talk about one microbiome-based therapy that's been useful for addressing uh, specific health outcomes, that's fecal microbiota transplantation or a poop transplant. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then Kieran's gonna talk about um, the ethical dimensions of microbiome science and technology and, uh, and a little bit about microbiome stewardship. So I wanna welcome all you hollow biomes. I bet you didn't know <laughs> that you were both human and microbial. Uh, so I want to welcome both the human side of you and the microbial side of you today. Um, for those people who are a little unfamiliar with the human microbiome, so we have about, this is a new estimate for the number of microbial cells in your body, but uh, in 2016 it was estimated we have about one uh, human cell for every 1.3 microbial cells, although that can change depending on whether you've defecated recently, apparently. Um, and the human microbiome, the, the content, the gene content, the potential metabolic uh, functions that are encoded in the microbiome we carry is quite vast, right? So we have maybe 20 or 30,000 human genes, but we may have millions of microbial genes that play that could play a role in our um, in our health and our physiology. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the intestinal or fecal microbiome today, or the microbiota. Uh, there's been, I'm sure, uh, reading newspapers, and television. There's a lot of information about. Uh, newly discovered relationships between the human microbiome and, um, and human health. Here's just a partial list. So I've worked for uh, many years on antibiotic-associated diarrhea. This is usually a hospital-acquired infection caused by clostridium difficile. And usually the biggest risk factor is exposure to antibiotics. So you can imagine if you're exposed to an antibiotic, your gut microbiome becomes deranged and distorted, and that can make you susceptible for, to develop that infection. Um, there's also been a lot of work on metabolic syndrome and obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, allergy and asthma, colon cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, cardiovascular disease, and the list is quite long. Um, and just a couple of examples. So here's the, one of the primary studies that was conducted uh, in diabetes, and you'll see there's a whole metagenome-wide association study, so for the epidemiologists in the audience, you've heard of GWA studies, genome-wide association studies. So this is metagenome. The metagenome includes the genomes of all the microbial organisms in your body. Uh, and whether those, those genomes, those organisms, and their function play a role in uh, the susceptibility to diabetes. 
So there was some evidence that butyrate produces bacteria, uh, uh, and some other organisms may uh, put you at risk of, it, of diabetes. Uh, here's the New England Journal paper on uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes and the microbiome. Uh, and so this is very interesting. So you know, we're talking about or, you know, microbial organisms, infectious organisms, quote unquote, but they play a role in, they may play a role in chronic disease. So this is very interesting. Uh, and I think we'll be under, uh, under investigation for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> some of the lay uh, coverage. So this was a, a cover for the New York Times Magazine <coughs> looking at allergy and asthma in kids. And this was actually a cover in 2006 uh, looking at the role of micro, the microbiome in obesity. This is actually the cover that got me interested in studying this. And you can feed your microbiome well, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> Uh, this is quite a preparation, Re recognizing this is, a, this is an untapped, um, uh, understudy, or has traditionally been an understudied area of human health. You know, there's just a, a phenomenal growth in ways you can modify your microbiome. So we're going to talk a little bit about that um, in the talk. So, just want to place, this is my own opinion about where things are right now. <laughs> so, originally, it was just the cool scientists that were interested. These were the... Uh, mouse geneticists and uh, uh, microbial ecologists who really know how to do this work. They've been doing it for decades, right? So um, mostly operating in obscurity. Uh, and then huge technological advancements allowed us to study the microbes. So you imagine, you may have in your gut 500 different species of bacteria. A lot of them we don't, maybe cult cultivatable, but we don't know how to do it yet. So how do you really study them? So it was really the advancement in, uh, in next generation sequencing that allowed, allowed investigators to really understand, examine the composition of your microbiome and maybe some of the functions. And so that, the cost of that has dropped enormously in the last about 15 years. And so it's possible to do these investigations where we couldn't culture the organisms, but now we can sort of study them using whole genome sequencing. So as a result of that huge in investment and interest in, these, in, in the investigation, quite a lot of studies that have been published. As we all know in epidemiology, being you know, ingrained cynics, you know, a, lot of this, a lot of the results may be difficult to replicate, um, uh, you know, could be issues around multiple testing and multiple comparisons. So you know, we're at this stage right now. I think we've just pressed it, and now people are sort of saying, oh, wait a second, maybe we want to we won't want to believe the relationship that you're showing until we see multiple studies or we understand the mechanism or something like that. So it's, it's something that we're very familiar uh, with in epidemiology. So as that, so there'll be more discouragement and disheartening uh, feelings and then we're going to come to terms with it. And I think truly there will be interventions that will have a significant impact on epidemiology. So we're at the point where you know, we're, we're sorting out what's meaning and what's not. <clears throat> Okay, so just like spending a moment uh, on science here. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you can, so I've given you some examples of how the microbiome plays a role in human health, but how would you modify the microbiome, right? So everybody in this room has 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 13th organisms in their gut, right? So we've, a lot of people have taken probiotics, etc. You take an organism like that, and they reach the gut, and they say, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> And they're looking at the little beady eyes of 10 to the 12 other <laughs> organisms. So you can imagine the competition that's involved. Like, how do, you, how do you affect that kind of community? So if you look at the gut, there's some avenues to do that. So we do that through, as I mentioned, probiotics. But it, that can be challenging when you have a fully defined microbiome in your gut. Uh, but you have a closely related organism that may be able to outcompete an organism you don't want or a group of organisms you don't want in your gut. So this is probably in the future we'll have more complex probiotics. Uh, and then you can do selective depletion or enrichment. So this should be familiar to us, right? If you take an antibiotic, you're going to wipe out, it's like carpet bombing, really. Uh, you're going to wipe out a whole group of organisms that are susceptible to that drug. You can also use the um, uh, antibacterial factors, these are, these are um, micro, often micro-produced molecules that work against other microbes. Because the microbes have been around each other for eons, they've worked out ways to compete successfully with each other. So you can use uh, molecules like that, you can use prebiotics or nutritional interventions. So this is the easiest thing to think about. 
when you eat and you feed your body, you're not just feeding yourself, you're feeding all the organisms in your body. Right? All of that nutritional excess waste, in some cases in the microbiome, they're being utilized by those bugs. So by changing your diet, you can change the composition of that community. Uh, so that's a very powerful way to do it. Then we have immune selection. So one example of that would be vaccinations. So for years and years, public health has introduced vac vaccines. The, the organisms that are targeted by that vaccine, specific strains usually, will be depleted in an organism, but often that niche will be filled with other organisms, maybe not disease-causing organisms, but they may take the place of that. So we can think about the new modulation and changing the microbiome that way. You can also modify physical barriers. So simply moving things through your system more quickly can change the composition. Mucin production, so this is the mucus lining your gut. The bacteria often will, will feed off, some bacteria will feed off the mucus, so depending on whether you are enriched or depleted in mucus, that can influence what's there. And then the last one is microbiota restoration. So we're going to talk about microbiota transplantation as, a, as a, a way to achieve microbiota restoration. So fecal microbiota transplantation is a procedure in which fecal matter or stool from fully screened healthy donors uh, is infused into a, a, a recipient or a patient. You can go uh, the bottom up route, which is by a colonoscopy or enema, or by the upper route. The, through uh, endoscopy, through a nasodigital tube, or uh, as affectionately affect known, crapsules. <laughs> so this is lyophilized poop that's put in a capsule and then swallowed, usually multiple ones, in order to repopulate, you know, reestablish a, a microbial community in your gut. So this is just to prove it's been around for a long time. Uh, it made it to Gray's Anatomy in 2008, right? So huge interest in it. Uh, so this, uh, subject had purchased antibiotics online for acne and had developed C, clostridium difficile. So probably the most important application of fecal microbiota transplantation has been in the area of antibiotic-associated diarrhea caused by clostridium difficile. Uh, but I'm going to give you an example of what somebody looks like who has developed clostridium difficile diarrhea. So you understand why you might consider uh, microbiota restoration as a way to achieve a cure. So this is a 66-year-old uh, male patient. Uh, this is from a study we did in, in Montreal, actually. Uh, they had pneumonia. They had 15 fecal samples over a period of about 50 days. Uh, you'll see here the relative abundance of specific taxa are displayed here in different colors. So each color uh, relates to a specific microbial organism. Uh, on the bottom here are all the exposures that that individual received while hospitalized. So quite a lot of medications, <coughs> antibiotics over time. And you can also see the diversity here. The diversity is this broken line. So you can see the diversity go up and down during their period of time in the hospital. Uh, can anybody guess what the, and for people who've seen this picture, they can't say it. Can anybody guess what the, what the red is? Let's, let's, I'll give you a clue. So often, these blooms of these organisms occur after exposure to vancomycin. Nobody? Vancomycin resistant enterococci. So this is uh, one of the major, you know, quote unquote, superbugs that are becoming increasingly difficult to treat. So you have vancomycin treatment and you have a bloom in enterococci over time. Um, and then, you know, you have the, the niche filled by other organisms. But you can imagine, if you're an epidemiologist, and we're supposed to be trained to measure these things, when you measure someone, it really matters. If you measure somebody here, the entire community is going to be is going to look like it's all in our coxi. Whereas if you measure here, it would be uh, there would be a big amount of U bacteria in the in the gut, right? So really, to, you know, measuring is, can be very challenging. Now this is a highly dynamic patient, right? And most people are a little bit more even keeled than this. But you can see why it's really challenging to measure uh, the microbiota and look at how it's related to health. So this is the first trial of fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT, in clostridium difficile patients. So you can see uh, the cure rates uh, in the first infusion of donor feces in, uh, in infected patients, and then after two infusions, compared to the standard care, which was vancomycin, or vancomycin with a, a lavage, a, a kind of a clean, cleansing of the bowel. <coughs> Of course, the trial had to be stopped early because there's massive difference in the treatment. 
And when I talked to clinicians who used this therapy early on to treat C. diff, they said people come in with two years of diarrhea. Sometimes they have to be on vancomycin to control the diarrhea. Sometimes they're passing stools up to 10 times a day. They give the fecal transplant, and within six hours, the patients are better. You know, like this, this miracle cure, you know. And really, it took poop, <laughs> right? All of medicine, right? And it really was just an infusion of poop. Anyway. <laughs> so here's just an example of what happens after. So this is a five-year-old heart transplant patient who had recurrent, recurrent uh, clostridium difficile infection. You see, before the transplant, they had all proteobacteria. So this is a, a group of bacteria that include things like uh, Klebsiella and coli, things like that. And then they have the transplant, and boom, they go back to what looks like the donors, right, where it's mostly from acutes. And then they get infected again. Again, it's mostly proteobacteria, and then they have the transplant, and they go back to looking more like the donor. So I'm going to shift here to some work that we do in my lab. Uh, <clears throat> everybody in the room probably is aware that we have an antimicrobial resistance crisis in public health. A huge impact in the future. Here's one estimate from the UK government, the Wellcome Trust, just looking at the difference in deaths attributed to different health outcomes. And this is what's estimated the deaths attributable to antimicrobial resistance in 2050, right? So this is what it is now, and this is what it's expected to be. So it's really, we need to find mechanisms uh, to address this problem. So could we use microbiome altering therapies to try to address the issue of antimicrobial resistance. So many infections occur, uh, usually the reservoir for the organism that causes that drug resistant infection is actually a patient's own gut. So they're harboring those organisms, and then those organisms manage to get into their bloodstream or their urinary tract or something like that. So could we use fecal microbiota transplantation to eliminate those organisms from the gut before, these are highly drug resistant organisms, could you eliminate them from the gut before that person goes on to develop an infection. So that's what we wanted to try to address. So the idea is that you take an antibiotic, you take an antibiotic, you have bacteria and these little red squares here that are resistant. You have an overgrowth after exposure to antibiotics to those drug-resistant organisms, and you also have a decrease, usually you observe a decrease in the diversity of the microbiota in your gut. You provide fecal transplantation, and then you have an increase in diversity and a reduction in antibiotics resistance genes, which is what we wanted to test. Um, but just to stop for a minute, is there any evidence that this could work clinically in patients? So some very astute investigators who were looking at fecal transplant for Clostridium difficile happened to notice that fecal transplant not only got rid of C. diff, but it also got rid of vancomycin resistant enterococci, also got uh, uh, rid of carbon producing uh, uh, carbapenemase producing Klebsiella in the next. So here's just uh, uh, a summary of the, the studies that have looked at this. Many of them are tiny case series, sometimes one patient, so just one case report. But you see here's seven case reports of multidrug resistant E. coli or Klebsiella, and of those seven patients, all were decolonized. So that drug resistant organism was removed from their gut. Uh, there are some examples where they are not fully decolonized, so we don't yet know how efficacious this would be. Here are some studies that have looked at vancomycin resistant enterococci, because if you do a fecal transplant, can you eliminate those organisms? There's been one study on methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and one, uh, just a couple of studies on Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So these are all highly drug resistant, considered superbugs. Uh, there's some clinical evidence that fecal transplant can decolonize patients with those before they might develop an infection. So we wanted to test this. We had a cohort of C. diff patients who, uh, who had received a fecal transplant. Uh, they had you know, eight recipients and eight stool donors, so pairs. Usually the donors are family members. Um, <clears throat> the fecal transplants were performed by Dr. Lung and Mark Miller in Montreal. And uh, in my lab, we did the whole metagenome uh, the sequencing of the stool samples from both the recipients and the donors. And if people have questions about this, I don't have that much time to go into all of the methods. But basically, we took the poop from the subjects, broke open all the bacterial cells, sequenced all of the DNA from those microbial organisms, and we can look to see which organisms are present in the gut. And we can also look to see whether there were changes in resistance genes uh, in the recipient before and after uh, their transplant. And we followed them at three days, seven days, 14, 30, 60, and 90 days after transplant. 
We looked at the composition of the microbiota and also the resistance gene carriage. So here, just looking at composition. Uh, so just to orient you to the figure, so we have uh, on the side here, you have each pair. So pair number one, pair number two, pair number three. Uh, and each box is a specific bacterial <coughs> genera. Uh, so you bacteria, we have some that are uh, normal commensals, so they sort of belong in your gut and should be there, things like Eubacterium, Roseburia, etc. And then you have some opportunistic pathogens that we're interested in, so Klebsiella that happens to be a genus that carries these drug-resistant genes. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look, and then time is on the, on the x-axis here, so this is pair number one, the donor, recipient at the time of FMT, recipient after FMT, and so on. So you can see, let's look at a bad bug first. So here you have the donors. None of the donors, really, except for two, maybe had Klebsiella in their gut uh, uh, in the stool specimen that they provided to the recipient. The recipients had a ton of Klebsiella, and then over time, they tended to lose uh, colonization of Klebsiella. So the, and so the darker the blue, sorry, I should have said that, the darker the blue, the more abundant the organism, the lighter the blue, the less abundant and the X's are just missing data. So you can kind of see for organisms that are commensals, let's look at this one, for example, the donors had it, the recipients didn't, but the recipients started to acquire it over time. So this is a kind of this idea of a restoration of the microbiome. So that's the, uh, the composition. So uh, there had been one study prior to this looking at uh, the removal of drug-resistant genes as a result of fecal transplant. But we also wanted to ask the question, can you acquire genes from the donor? So we're giving this therapy, we better be sure that, you're giving this therapy for fecal transplant, you don't want to also transfer uh, organisms that carry uh, genes and that are highly resistant to antibiotics. So we did, uh, so we looked at that, there were actually 37 genes uh, with evidence meeting the, meeting the definition of having been acquired. So about 37 genes, only about three were really were considered clinically significant. In other words, these were these are antimicrobial resistance genes that are that are problematic or have been found problematic. Most of these genes, I think almost all of them, were acquired at visit one, right, or visit two. So within two to three days of fecal transplant, or within seven days. So they really it looks like it was something that was provided by the donor. Uh, and then we had evidence of depletion. So there were about 95 resistance genes that met the requirement for depletion from the recipient. So this is instances where it was found in the recipient and then was depleted. And here's just some examples again of some uh, resistance genes for those people who are familiar with the gene, uh, resistant gene nomenclature, here's some examples. Uh, and the number of uh, donor recipient pairs that experienced that. Uh, you have to realize that most of the organisms that are gut are also intrinsically resistant. So we're really interested in, in resistance genes that have shown up in the clinical literature uh, to be a problem. So we have bugs that are intrinsically resistant to drugs. We're not so worried about that, but we're worried about trying to decolonize people with drugs uh, to, to get rid of these highly drug resistant organisms. Isn't that, doesn't that happen? Like even before I teach, that happens. We're going to give you your update now, whether you want it or not. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have a new study, and we've recruited our first few patients. So we're going to test whether fecal transplant can decolonize renal transplant patients who are intestinally colonized with highly drug-resistant organisms, specifically uh, extended spectrum beta-lactamase-producing or carbapenase-producing organisms. So we're going to look for successful decolonization and see if that's sustained. We're also going to see whether this is safe in real transplant patients, the durability of the effect, if there's a reduction in, in, uh, in infections that are caused by drug-resistant organisms in the real transplant patients, and we're going to look at mechanism of action using uh, metagenomics. And real transplant, renal transplant patients are a good group to study. They've had a lot of hospitalizations, they've had surgery, they've been on dialysis in some cases. They're really at risk for having these drug-resistant organisms and for developing extra intestinal infections like kidney infections. And when they get a fake kidney infection, that can lead them to lose their, their organ. So just a summary. So this is from clinicaltrials.gov. So this is a registry of all the studies that are using just fecal microbiota transplantation. This is not a summary of probiotic studies or 
uh, vaccine-based diets, anything else. This is just fecal microbiota transplantation as a way to modify the microbiota and impact human health. So you can see, obviously, the most, most studies are around C. diff infection, which is what it's, there's clearly a use for fecal transplant. Um, inflammatory bowel disease is another big one. Uh, there's some evidence to suggest you can reduce recurrences, but I think the jury is still out. We are part of this group, decolonization of drug-resistant bacteria. This is kind of a novel way to deal with the, the crisis of drug resistance. Uh, out, irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, and then we have a few studies on peanut allergy, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, malnutrition, cancer. So I think people are, it, and this is going to be a long haul because it's not clear if you have somebody who has an intact microbiota, you have to actually alter it, you have to deplete it in order to engraft, in, in order to have a successful engraftment of a new microbiota. So this is really, this is challenging work uh, and it will take a while um, to see some, uh, some final results. So I just have a lot of people to acknowledge. The study that we're currently doing is with Ted Stein, Alyssa Wright, and Jennifer Grant, and now with Victor Lund, who's in uh, Vancouver. Uh, uh, Victor and Mark, who helped with the C. diff study in Montreal. Uh, Thad Edens, my bioinformatician. Carolyn Vincent, who did all the sequencing for all this, the study in Montreal. And my technicians, and just to acknowledge the PCCDC Foundation, which supported the metagenomic studies looking at antimicrobial resistance genes dynamics. And then the study that we're, the clinical study we're doing is uh, the Transplant Research Foundation of BC looking at the new transplant patients. Um, so uh, I'm going to allow uh, 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 Stefan and Alex to switch over the slides so that um, uh, Kieran can do his talk on the ethics of this. But I want to uh, point out one story because it was just recently published this week. So in the, in the journal Nature, there was a, um, uh, a publication looking at neonatal sepsis. And in India, they gave kids within the first two to three days of life, they gave the children Lactobacillus plantarum, which is a, is a probiotic that's been used widely, and a prebiotic to go with it, right? So it's a good thing to give a prebiotic, which is the nutrients that the probiotic needs to eat in order to survive. Give the probiotic, Lactobacillus, and the prebiotic to infants the first couple of days of life, they had an over 40% reduction in neonatal sepsis rates, right? So in that case, in the kid's case, you have a very young microbiota. They've just been born. They're just, the architecture of their microbiota is just starting to develop. It's, it's almost a blank slate. So it kind of makes sense that lactobacillus might work in that setting. It'll be interesting to see if that study can be replicated in different places. Uh, but it's interesting now, think for a second as a segue to what Karen's is going to talk about is if you suddenly gave all neonates lactobacillus plantarum. We all have very diverse microbiota. We started differently. We were born in different places in different circumstances. So our microbiota developed unique to us. There's a lot of things that are in common with everybody in the room, but there's some unique element to it. But here, you have an intervention, a pretty significant public health intervention where you could give uh, a probiotic to newborns. What impact would that have on a population-wide scale? intervening in that kind of complex community and starting it out in a specific way. Anyway, so thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions at the end, and I'll turn it over uh, to Kieran. Thank you very much, Amy. Can you hear me? Okay, it's always a real pleasure to uh, reconnect with uh, UBC, and uh, Amy gave me a fantastic segue to um, continue talking about the ethics of microbiome therapy. So, uh, there are a number of ethical implications to microbiome research. Some of these uh, have to do with privacy and the kind of information that is contained in uh, a person's microbiome that you might not want to share with other people. There's also questions around ownership of samples. So uh, I uh, just last week was called up by the chair of our r and here at Wealth, who uh, was dealing with a, uh, a protocol about uh, poop uh, that was being collected from patients without their consent or even knowledge for, for studies. 
And uh, because the hospital considers this waste, this was seen as, as not problematic. And, and she said she didn't feel comfortable with that. And you know, what, what should we do about that? And I think that's, of course, a really big public question. Uh, and so this is the, the age-old question of who owns your poop. Um, there's also implications with regards to return of results of microbiome studies. So um, in genome studies, now there's been a big push for returning uh, study results back to patients and study participants, uh, but only if they're, if they're meaningful in some way. So maybe if they're clinically actionable and also have utility. It's not quite clear with microbiome studies yet what we should be returning. Uh, and then also there are all sorts of questions about around actionability of microbiome findings. So especially with a lot of direct to consumer microbiome uh, sequencing companies uh, promising all sorts of things, what is really actionable in a meaningful way? So uh, these kinds of considerations are all what I would call individual level considerations. So ethical implications that pertain largely to an individual. What I want to talk about today is at a different level, and that is more of a public health level. So microbiome science recognizes uh, humans as complex systems, and, and I think that's really obvious from, from what Amy's uh, explained so, so well. Um, therefore, medical applications of microbiome science also recognize this kind of complexity, uh, um, and in particular between human genome and, and microbiome. So, so fecal microbial therapy is an example of that. However, the clinical focus, in spite of this complexity, is very much still on the individual. So if, if it's about C. difficile infection, for example, the focus would be on the individual with that infection and then treating, treating that, that problem with, with the individual. However, human beings are themselves part of larger ecological, ecological systems. And um, where did we acquire uh, whatever problem it is that we're dealing with uh, that we are now trying to fix through microbiome therapies? And so what I'm suggesting, therefore, is that uh, a comprehensive analysis of health and ethical dimensions of microbiome science and microbiome therapies really requires this broader public health lens of viewing uh, humans as embedded in these larger ecological systems. So that there are two key points that I would like to address. The first one uh, follows on precisely from Amy's last scenario, and that is what are possible potential public health and ethical implications of widespread use of microbiome therapies? And then the second point I, I want to speak to is um, increasing recognition of damage to our shared collective microbiomes and uh, an argument that we really need to have some form of stewardship of, of our collective microbiomes. So to the first point, as already indicated by Amy, um, we, we have evidence that uh, exposures in infancy may lead to lasting effects on the microbiome into adulthood. At the same time, uh, there is some evidence suggesting that the composition of an individual's microbiome continues to be affected by some of the individuals with whom we come in contact with, even in adulthood. So for example, uh, some studies have shown similarities in microbiomes across family members, and this is important even for non-genetically related family members. So it's not simply that the, the human genome um, predisposes to a certain type of microbiome, even when there is uh, no shared genetic uh, link, we still see some of that similarity. Some studies also show uh, similarities of microbiomes in members of the same sports teams. And then we also, of course, find uh, similarities uh, in microbiomes of certain communities, in particular when those communities are somewhat <coughs> isolated from, from other communities. So what I conclude from, from these studies is that when it comes to your own personal microbiome, it matters potentially what people around you do with their microbiomes. And this has implications for individual autonomy and for public health. 
So I'd like to uh, do a bit of a thought experiment here um, and look at uh, obesity and, and microbiome. And we know that um, microbiome scientists have been focusing on obesity for a, for a long time now. And as far as I know, there's no blockbuster application that's come from that. But with all the attention, it is certainly conceivable that there might be, at some point, an over-the-counter probiotic stimulant pill based on microbiome science. Now, I'm not, I'm not predicting this. This is more just for the sake of the thought experiment. So the questions I would then like to ask are what are the potential implications for one, of one person taking such a pill for other people? So for example, if my wife decided to take a probiotic living pill that changes her microbiome in such a way that her metabolism is more lean, and if she does this over time, she keeps taking these pills to maintain that change, does that affect me? Does that affect our children? given the close proximity that we have to each other. Or, given, the, given obesity as a case study, what are the potential implications of perhaps millions of people taking such pills over a prolonged period of time? Would this change not only the microbiomes of those individuals taking the slimming pill, would it, share, would it change the shared microbial um, environment within which we all live, would it, would it potentially change the pool of microbes that we get exposed to in our daily lives? And in particular, of course, I'm thinking also here about infants, what they are exposed to in the, in the critical period of time when their microbiome becomes established. If, if there are these larger uh, community or societal level effects, what would be the implications for malnourished individuals or for underweight individuals who have the opposite problem and then are not able to uh, put on weight, would a changed microbial environment add to their health problems? So as I mentioned before, there are ethical implications of autonomy um, and, and the fact that if this, if this panned out, an individual's health might be affected by the actions of others changing their microbiomes. And of course, perhaps more importantly, public health implications in, in the sense of uh, questions around safety, if large numbers of individuals change their microbiomes, and whether this might lead to detrimental changes to community-wide changes uh, of collective microbiomes. So I want to point out again, this is completely speculative, and so I'm not making an argument that this is going to happen or predict that this will happen. Rather, what I'm suggesting is that we're not asking the right questions yet. We do need more evidence around these things, and in particular, we don't really know to what degree um, one person changing their microbiome might lead to changes in another person's microbiome. So the second main point that I want to talk about uh, relates to microbiome stewardship. So we have evidence now of all kinds of environmental influences changing the microbiome. And here are just a, a few that I've listed. By the way, I didn't want to clutter up the slides with um, with refer references, and I included some re a reference at the end, uh, a paper that most of this talk is based on that includes detailed um, citations for all of these claims. So we know that smoking can influence the microbiome, broad nutritional trends in a community or society, exposure to pollutants, cultural food preferences. We've seen that the overall societal shift towards more sedentary lifestyles affects the microbiome mode of infant delivery affects the microbiome, formula versus breastfeeding affects it, and also prescribing practices for antibiotics have a huge effect on, on the microbiome. Uh, so this is both um, microbiome, sorry, uh, antibiotics prescribed by general practitioners and in one-on-one -on -one settings, but also prophylactic use, for example, in, in childbirth. So what I'd like to point out here is that uh, all of these factors are decisions, but a lot that are associated with what we might call damage to the human microbiome. Now, not only are we recognizing a lot more of these conditions, but we're also recognizing 
uh, mm. and C is an increase in some of these diseases, such as atopic diseases, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and IBD. So, because we also notice important differences in microbiomes between westernized and industrialized societies and communities and, and less uh, industrially developed communities, the suggestion is that there is something about the societal practices of Western lifestyle or, uh, or industrialization that is leading to damage of the microbiome. And of course, the question here is, should we be protecting this shared collective microbiome? So there is, again, need for more research. These are speculative arguments. We need to know more about how microbiomes are transmitted between individuals. We need to know specifically about which societal practices lead to uh, adverse changes in individual and collective microbiomes. And we also need to understand more about the scale at which these effects operate. Is it local, regional, or global? So all of this uh, is, leads me to um, a call for microbiome stewardship. Uh, and I think uh, we can borrow a lot here from microbial ecologists and, and people who, who think at those larger levels in recognizing microbiomes collectively. So it's not only that I walk around with my microbiome and you with yours, we share a common pool of, of microbes uh, in our environment. And these should be recognized as a public or common good. When we damage through our collective practices this collective environment, we all, uh, we all stand to suffer from that. And I would suggest, therefore, next that we need strict and precautionary policy interventions to safeguard healthy community-level microbiomes. So not only do we need to have therapies in the clinic that help others deal with individuals who have damaged microbiomes, we need to have policies that prevent this damage in the first place. So here's the reference uh, that I mentioned. Uh, a lot of the details of my argument are found in here. And I'd like to thank all of my collaborators um, for their part in this project. Okay, thank you, Kieran. Hopefully you can hear me. That was amazing. Um, and thank you, Amy. It is now time for a question period. So there's two ways to ask, uh, three ways to ask questions. Uh, number one, if you're in the room, just put your hand up. Um, and if you are online, people that are joining us via Adobe Connect, you can type uh, questions in, and Stefan will make sure those get to me. And you can also tweet questions at us uh, using the Twitter hashtag uh, SPPH rounds. Um, so, well, it's time to do a computer thing. Do we have any questions from in the room? Let's go to Fred. <laughs> this is for Kira. I would argue we're already changing microbiomes transformably with many things we do in our society and FMTs and probiotics and things that there's some new versions of, but antibiotic use is, is a terrific example. We're already doing that and yet there's very little recognition as a society that, that we are actually causing these big changes and not having these effects. So I'd argue we're already there and we're, we're doing it. I will attempt to rephrase that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'll do? I'll just give it to Brett because it's Brett Finley and he should be able to talk to you directly about <laughs> microbiome stuff because he's the man. Karen, I would argue we're already doing it in terms of our antibiotic use, use of antibiotics, we grow supplements, for example, and um, diet changes, et cetera, et cetera. And I would argue we're well down that pathway already. Actually, my biggest concern is what's going to happen in the future. Should we be preserving certain microbial species that are going extinct as we change our society? So it's more of a comment than a question. Amazing. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I completely agree uh, with that, Fred. I, I, I do, th and, and so that was the kind of the, the latter half of my talk that uh, we have done a lot of this damage, and we need to figure out um, how to deal with it, not only on the individual level but on the collective level. Yes. Thank you. It's Dave Patrick here. So to build on that, I mean, yes, we've been messing with microbiome since Dagnac and Fleming. So a better part of a century of experience. And uh, Karen was speaking about, you know, we're, we've been dealing with this with antimicrobial stewardship. You're talking about stewardship there. There are already some ethical and therapeutic principles that are being played out in the world of medicine now around antibiotics, really only using them if they're absolutely required to improve or rescue the health of an individual. 
I'm just wondering to what extent, Amy or Karen, you think those things are transposable? I mean, do we have to reinvent the wheel here, or do we have a lot of principles we can just carry over? Karen, I'll let you answer that. Do you want to take that one, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> I'll row shampoo. Uh, yeah, no, I think there's a lot that's, that's transferable, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Karen, do you have anything else to add? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only thing I, I think I, I'd add is a, a lot of um, ethical principles are, are based on individual level protection. Um, and uh, I think maybe, maybe a good comparison is also climate change, right? Um, so it's not simply that we need to look at what's going on at, with individual patients. We look, need to look at what are we doing to the overall environment. Uh, so I think, yes, there are transferable principles, but I think we're just not sufficiently recognizing this collectivity of this shared environment. OK, we've got an online question, um, which is examples of policies that might be effective in microbial stewardship. Um, so Kieran, we'll bump that one to you first, and then see if you've got anything to add. Kieran, did you get that? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, yes, I'm just reading the uh, question. Oh, yes, you can see it uh, possibly on your Adobe Connect. It's the shorter question about uh, policies that you think can be effective. We'll get to the longer question on the microbial similarity in a moment. Ah, uh, policies I think might be effective. Okay, yes. So I, I'm thinking here not so much um, about uh, specific new policies. I'm thinking about retuning existing policies, for example, with pollution. So is it particular pollutants that, for example, are, are contributing to damage to the microbiome that leads to IBD or, is it, or increases risk of IBD? Is it pollutants or is it certain food additives? I, I'm just not sure that we've done the research uh, in that particular direction. Uh, you know, have we looked at the right kind of effects uh, when we've when we've um, developed policy on those sorts of issues? So, so that's where where I would suggest we need to start looking. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then the next question um, is more of a microbiologically oriented one. It's for those shared microbial communities. Um, how much of those microbial similarities are driven by sharing um, of the organisms versus the effect of commonalities in diet? So if one member of a family changes their diet in a way to change the microbiome but the other family don't, what is the follow-on effect of the microbiomes of the people in the family that didn't uh, eat differently? Amy? Yeah, I think most of the studies that have been done are directly in the, in the individuals who are changing their diet, not as, as a as an investigation of the secondary effects of dietary change, maybe that's, a, that's the next stage of research. So I think that, I mean, clearly there's similarities in, within households and, and, uh, and close, uh, close contacts, uh, but I don't think we've measured, for example, changes in diet and whether they have yeah, secondary, exactly. secondary yeah. influences yeah. On, um, on, <laughs> on other people in the household. <laughs> The Roland Space Echo pedal. Um, I will run the microphone off to the back of the room for another in room question. Hey, this is a question for Amy. Um, and how much fast forwarding into the future, knowing this is not benign, the fecal transplants, do you? For see people using this prophylactically, say you know you're going in for elective surgery. Um, I also worked, used to work in the ICU, and the respiratory therapist once told me, "Oh, we are colonized with all kinds of anti-resistant um, bugs, and if you get intubated, you're getting, it's oh, it's totally over for you." I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think healthcare workers in the future would, uh, you know, check their microbiome and take some pill in the future to change it away from that? Um, yeah, so I, I don't think anybody, myself or anybody, really wants whole filtered stool as a therapy. Uh, so far it's been fairly safe, although the long-term follow-up is not really there yet. Uh, there have been relatively few adverse events. Most adverse events are about the infusion, so during uh, you know, sedation for colonoscopy, for example, there have you know, been problems. Um, but in terms of infections, it's pretty safe. Nevertheless, we, don't, we only can check for what we know. 
that's contained in the stool. So it would be ideal if we had a defined community a consortium of bacteria that could function in that way uh, and would have the same effectiveness. So you could give it and then it would exclude specific organisms. So ideally, uh, right now, it looks like fecal transplant works. I just don't know whether we can create a, a similar product. I know there's a lot of people who are investigating this uh, that can work just as well and would, would serve the same purpose to exclude those drug-resistant organisms specifically. So we won't, we won't know, but we're going to try to extend our, our study to ICU patients too, uh, because of course they also are, are very vulnerable to drug-resistant infections. Super cool talk. Mm -hmm. uh, very educational. Uh, a total question out of interest. Um, is there any of the work that you're doing, Amy, that um, shows a sex difference in the effectiveness of the transplantations at all? I'm thinking more in terms of the chronic disease side of it, like diabetes, yeah. than the infectious side of it. The answer for this CHR cover page where you have to talk about sex and biological right. differences. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know the literature on diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I don't know, or, or even some of the autoimmune diseases, other autoimmune diseases. I don't know. I mean, I know there's a sex distortion for that. I don't know if, um, you know, these studies are just underway. Maybe they were registered on clinicaltrials.gov like within the last year or two. So I think it's going to be a few more years before we know whether it has an impact, and then we can ask the question if the studies are large enough whether there was a, a differential impact in them. Measure on lower risk of BP. <laughs> <laughs> David Patrick points out that men are at lower risk of bacterial vaginosis. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time for one more super good question, Charlie. Hi, we know that many of the interventions that are developed for in clinically for treating disease eventually find their way into broader and broader application. And Amy, you provided an example of that. Uh, and Karen, I think your example is not out of the question. So I want to ask the two of you, what do you see, what do you imagine the future spread of these developments being? Because we know there's a tendency to take medical interventions and move them into the public and population health arena. Um, what, are, what, what do you think are the possibilities and, I guess, uh, the likelihood that that track will be followed? Excellent question. Just to clarify, do you mean like consumers doing it? Or do you mean, so for example, taking you know, a defined community and putting in the water supply? <laughs> I'm talking about the general trend of medical interventions tend to move out to populations, so consumers. So it, yeah. it could be either way. Yes, yeah, so um, I can talk about that with respect to fecal transplants. So um, uh, there's a DIY web page for if you want to do your own fecal transplant. Do not recommend this <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. But this is just an example. I think that uh, you know, for, for patients who have suffered for years, and here you see kind of a new angle uh, on the disease you have. For example, inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, people have suffered with the symptoms of that for years and years. And they see this as a possible avenue to help. Uh, I mean, I remember <clears throat> after publishing my first papers on C. diff, getting phone calls from upset mothers about their sons who had the pediatric IBD and just where they could get a fecal transplant, thinking that that might help. So that has already spilled over. And you can see from the example uh, that I gave, you know, cookbooks and things like that. So people are already experimenting with this individually. Um, I don't know what the impact of that is. There's not really... Uh, a mechanism to measure that, but it's um, citizen science, but not always in a good way, and but potentially damaging and harmful way too. So yeah, I'm totally on. All right, with that, we're at 10 o'clock in the morning, so please join me in thanking our two absolutely amazing presenters.
our next rounds will be October 27th. We're going to be in a different location, and we've got a special Halloween surprise for you. Um, and stay tuned to your email for more. Thanks, everybody. Have a super Friday. I'm blame you entirely for everything. I'm trying to buy your six hundred dollar laptop. Three Gs. That used to be three Gs. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We did. We already know asking in the chat. So he's funny. So there's coffee and stuff. Um, no, Michelle.